Hi everyone, I'm Michael Lardner from the Marxist Education Project, and I'm welcoming all of you today to hear Victor Wallace on socialist practice, histories, and theories. Uh, this is part of the Palgrave Macmillan Marx Engels Marxism series, which is uh, uh, a great series of multiple volumes of which Victor's is an important part. Uh, uh, our upcoming event, our very next event is not until June 6th, which is with the Yale Working Group on Globalization and Culture, where the uh, group of uh, those at Yale studying, most of them are capital students, and they, they this year are presenting on the theme of resources and relations that result from the division of resources. Uh, they do incredibly dynamic and varied uh, presentations of various and, uh, areas of research. Mm -hmm. After that, the weekend after that, we have uh, Trevor Ng Nguane visiting from Johannesburg, where he works in the shack settlements of organizing, and he will be speaking on grassroots democracy and the development of that in South Africa. Everything else is on our website, including those events, uh, marxedproject.org. I don't want to take any more time away from Victor's presentation of his book. Uh, Victor has been a longtime supporter of the New York Marxist School, Breck Forum, and the Marxist Education Project. We are incredibly happy and uh, to host Victor and to take part in this discussion uh, that we all are about to do. Welcome, Victor. Thank you so much, Michael. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and to see all of you here. Um, above all, I want this to be a conversation. Uh, the book was a process of putting everything in order, but uh, the presentation uh, will, I think, benefit from a certain amount of disorder. Um, I want to immediately say that the book ranges enormously in the topics it covers. Uh, lots of examples from history, uh, various revolutions uh, ranging from Russia to Spain to Cuba, uh, issues like lesser evil, uh, debates like Marxism versus anarchism, the issue of intersectionality, above all running through most of it, uh, an attention to dialectics just as a kind of method. And so I want to just uh, mention that right at the beginning and say also, and, and this is uh, perhaps a confession, uh, people talk about how long it takes to write a book, uh, five years, 10 years, even more. Uh, I would say, uh, to be quite candid, uh, in terms of the content of this book, it took 45 years to write. Uh, that doesn't mean that it was the only thing I was doing during those 45 years, but it does mean that the earliest uh, article uh, in it was written 45 years ago, and one of the ones, the, the one about workers' control and revolution has gone through several incarnations, which began almost that long ago as well. And it's a book that I could never have planned in advance. Uh, the range is such uh, that it would have seemed overly ambitious. However, uh, thanks to the invitation of Marcello Musto, I was given the opportunity to try and draw together articles I had already written and published over the years, and then just to add an introduction and conclusion. So I'll speak briefly about all of these, but I, my main hope is that we'll engage in conversation. And the setting for this uh, historically uh, is the fact that we are at the moment in the midst of all the terrible news and terrible things going on around us. Nonetheless, at a moment where there's a revival of socialism, a revival of Marxism. It's been going on for a few years now, and it's reaching certain high points. The most recent that I heard of was the recent vote in Chile mm. to elect a constituent assembly to draw up a new constitution where they have an impregnable majority of uh, progressive representatives in this body to draw up a new constitution. So this is quite an extraordinary development, and I have a particular affinity with Chile, having spent a year there uh, during my graduate studies. And it has a distinctive importance, of course, in the history of socialism, having been the site 
of the first elected socialist president, you know, with a real agenda of transformation uh, in, in history, really. And it says that there had been some social democratic uh, leaderships elected in Europe, but not before social democracy in Europe had already abandoned the idea of doing away with capitalism, essentially. And for me, socialism has always uh, entailed by definition uh, the dissolution of capitalist relations. Uh, and that's, of course, a controversial position in the present debate in the United States. But I think it's one that we have to sustain. And the challenge is to sustain it in a way that pays due attention to all the immediate requirements of political activity, of, of building a movement. So this has been, in a sense, my uh, concern from the beginning to di the, the dissolution of capitalist relations. And I must say that I came to this uh, notion or came to this feeling uh, quite early in life, uh, long before I'd had time to study history or uh, any of these uh, uh, complicated theoretical issues, uh, but just from a, a kind of uh, revulsion at uh, extreme class distinctions in the society. And you might say that I was from the beginning, again, without knowing it explicitly, attuned to dialectics because I felt myself to be in a contradictory position. Because here I was the beneficiary in a material sense of this whole structure and yet recoiling against that. So here it is, uh, dialectics uh, in, in its most basic form, but uh, translating that more directly into observation of the world, I came into, let's say, cognizance of the world around me uh, in the mid fifties at a time when there seemed to be a kind of immobility. Uh, this was the silent generation in the United States, a period of political repression, McCarthyism and so on. And the Soviet Union at that time, especially from what we knew about it, did not offer a favorable alternative to capitalism. So there was an extraordinary, uh, you might say pessimism really, uh, that, we, uh, that we worked with, that, that anyone uh, from my position worked with. And I must say that also that I had a kind of um, feeling that, that people who had come to their position of, uh, of advocating socialism in a gradual way, having tried all the various uh, reforms and found them inadequate, that they had an advantage over me in the sense of being better positioned to speak to other people about the arguments for it. Whereas I was coming directly from a sort of uh, in your face in a sense uh, that the whole thing is, is, is wrong and has to be fought viscerally uh, from the outset. Uh, this didn't seem like a good way to approach people. So in a sense, uh, one aspect of my education is in a sense been backpedaling from, the, from this position without ever abandoning it, but finding ways to connect it with the existing struggles that, uh, that people were, were going through. But so in any case, the, the, these early years of my, of my thinking were surrounded by the, the, the existential threat of, of nuclear war that was, that was overwhelming. And this seeming immobility, the stasis of, of the uh, conflict between the two great powers. And so in, in, in that sense, and, and here I, I talk about this in my uh, introduction a little bit, there's a short autobiographical section that um, uh, the Cuban revolution broke through this in a way that was extremely important and that really uh, determined the, uh, my decision to uh, focus my formal studies uh, on, on Latin American politics. And although I ceased after some years to be specializing in Latin America, uh, this nonetheless remained as a, as a consistent theme. And I had the good fortune to spend a year in Chile, which was uh, before the Allende government, but it was at a time where I was uh, able to see the potential of, of uh, popular mobilization and to get strong reinforcement for my, for my understanding. In the United States, uh, this uh, was the period of the 1960s. I have a whole chapter in the book about the 1960s, which I think is quite important in relation to this overall argument in, in the sense that I take up uh, a, a contention 
uh, to the effect that the, that the, that the left movements of the 1960s had, had a negative effect because they provoked the, uh, the right-wing reaction in the United States that, uh, that, uh, that succeeded it. And I, I try to argue against that by going into ex explanation of the circumstances under which the movements of the 1960s arose and into a, an extensive discussion of the positive contributions that they made uh, to, to the long-term development of a left movement in this country. So the, uh, quite a bit of the, uh, this discussion uh, regarding the 60s movements it, it focuses on distinctive aspects of the, of the United States, US history, something which I dealt with also in my short book, uh, Democracy Denied, that came out uh, two years ago. Uh, but I, I, I guess I would say really following the train in, in terms of putting all the, all the materials in order, uh, the, the easiest way to do so right here in, in the form of a brief introduction to our conversation is to do it in the sense of, of, of a kind of, kind of chronological approach to uh, how I got into addressing these issues. Uh, but uh, an important transition in, in my life was when I moved in 1970 to Indianapolis, having spent all my previous education uh, in the Northeast um, and, my, and also my first college teaching job in the Northeast, but moved to Indianapolis uh, where I was to stay for 24 years, uh, which I think gave me an indispensable, uh, let's say, experience of, the, of middle America and more directly of, of a kind of uh, reversion back to the political atmosphere that, uh, in which I had grown up of the 1950s, uh, just in terms of the uh, dominant hegemonic culture locally with the con uh, highly conservative press and so on. But uh, it was in Indianapolis that I was able to, uh, I had the opportunity uh, to really engage in the formal study of, of Marxism, which I had not done previously. I mean, I'd done, I'd read some of the basics, but uh, the, the opportunity to teach Marxist theory was something that arose unexpectedly. I had been uh, hired to teach Latin American politics in the general area of comparative politics. But I noticed that in the catalog for Indiana University, the system-wide catalog, there was a course offering in Marxist theory. So I decided to take that up. And, and that was my opportunity, which I continued to do all the rest of the time I was in Indianapolis. And as many people have said, there's no better way to learn something than by trying to teach it. And, and that, was, uh, that was an interesting uh, experience for me. But the, the other thing in Indianapolis that was extremely important, which remains a, a big part of my life to this day, can you hear okay? Yeah. Contact with, with prison activists, uh, in particular uh, individuals who had been in prison and then who put me back in contact with others who were still in prison. And although this was not yet the moment of hyper incarceration in this country, it was nonetheless the beginnings uh, of a contact that would prove to be extremely important and which for me uh, was valuable in the sense of uh, connecting me with a constituency that re readily understood the need for a radical social change in the United States. Uh, as George Jackson uh, commented, uh, prison either destroys you or it makes you invincible. Those are not his exact words, but it's roughly what, uh, what he said. And, and the, uh, those who were turned on to politics had an incre incredible disciplined dedication uh, to, to study. And this has been an inspiration to me on a continuing basis. So I, I can just mention a, a few of the other specific topics in the book. Again, I don't want to go on too long uh, at the beginning uh, because I'm anxious to have discussion about how any of this applies to current issues that we are considering now that we have to deal with now, whether it's things that are discussed directly in the book or not. Um, there's a, uh, I, I would say that in a th theoretical sense, uh, the key chapter is actually uh, one that is pr uh, printed the, uh, uh, unchanged from 1990, where I, I confronted the issue at that, right at that time of the dissolution of the, of the Soviet bloc and of the uh, so-called collapse of socialism um, and tried to uh, find a basis for saying that, that this was not the end of socialism. And, and at that time, that was uh, not an easy thing to do 
in the context of the uh, tremendous barrage of uh, sort of I told you so things uh, coming out of the bourgeois press, you know, to, to develop a, a full argument against this at that time was quite a challenge because uh, it, the kind of stampede away from socialism or, or from Marxism at least uh, had affected even certain sectors of the left. And I guess I should say it's especially a stampede away from Marxism as distinct from socialism because there were many people who still claim to be socialist, but who said that Marxism had been proved by this to, uh, development uh, to no longer be valid. So the, the essence of my argument, uh, but which is, uh, had, had to be developed at great length, was to uh, the importance of understanding socialism as uh, coming out of capitalism and raising the question of how something com can come out, you know, a, a phenomenon, a, a social for formation can come out of another uh, and yet at the same time uh, be uh, diametrically opposed to it. How it can come out of it yet be diametrically opposed to it. That, that was the fundamental challenge. And in addition, the challenge which was one that had not been directly addressed by Marx of discussing uh, what the situation is, or, or let's say dis discussing the configuration of socialism within a context of a capitalist world. What, what is the interaction of the two as they go, go forward? So, so this was something I, I tried to address in that, um, in that essay. And in a shorter piece that, that uh, followed right after it that constitutes the fourth chapter of my book, uh, it's a short piece that uh, the most of it originally appeared in the, in the monthly review at the time. And it was uh, called into, uh, into uh, let's say, I was inspired to write it because I was concerned by precisely certain individuals on the left in the United States at that time uh, uh, to say that, you know, we, we advocate for social justice and we uh, support all these struggles of all these people, but we don't like Marxism. So the, the question of what, what was the relationship of Marxism uh, to these other struggles? And the argument that I developed there is one that continues nowadays in the discussions about intersectionality, the question of how the issue of class relates to all the other dimensions of oppressive relationships. And I made the case uh, there already in, in, in 1990, actually even in the uh, chapter three essay about, about the transition, uh, but which I developed more fully in an intersectionality piece in 2015, uh, the case that, that class does have a distinctive strategic role compared to uh, all the other forms of oppression uh, in the sense that it, uh, it reflects interests that uh, dominate, the, let's say, the whole of, uh, the whole of society, that, that all the other forms of oppression uh, are based on dualities that uh, don't necessarily imply the superiority of one over another, that, that all the other dimensions, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, gender or sexuality or, or, uh, or ethnicity, uh, the claims of superiority of one party over, uh, over the other are completely false. They're, they're, let's say they are, they're artificially created. On the other hand, in the case of class, uh, Class is by definition a relationship of, of supremacy or subordination or subjugation, however you want to put it. So, so this, was, uh, this was something that I, I thought, on the one hand, it's, it seems like a fairly obvious thing to say, but on the other hand, it seems like, like something that is, is, uh, has been difficult for people to accept. And I think in the United States, that again, it reflects partly the impact of the tremendous political repression, ideological repression that characterized the 1940s and 1950s. So anyway, there's, there's something on that in the book. There's, there's a little bit uh, about the dialectic of humanity and nature, which is something I focus more on in, in my Red Green Revolution book. And there, the humanity and nature, I mean, the, the point that I try to argue uh, in contrast to certain uh, green tendencies is that the, uh, the relationships of domination or subjugation uh, involved in building up class society are uh, parallel to or, or coterminous with the relations of domination that are built up over against nature. And, and that uh, you, you don't end, you don't expect to end the subjugation of nature without ending also the subjugation of 
a whole class of human beings that the that the, the, the dynamic the, the the capitalist dynamic is responsible for both for both and although let's say the uh, the domination of nature uh, also existed prior to capitalism what it's connected with in, inseparably is class relationships uh, class subjugation and which of course in the present form is capitalist but but uh, class more generally is the uh, criterion of of subjugation and the effort to maintain class supremacy and the effort to uh, dominate nature are uh, uh, coincide. Uh, uh, another uh, big chapter which I've alluded to is one called Workers' Control and Revolution. That's the one that's developed over a long time. But in terms of the theoretical issues that uh, people are continuously coming back to, it's <coughs> an application with historical examples in different countries, uh, which comes down to the issue of uh, the conflict between Marxism and anarchism the conflict between so-called bottom-up and top-down uh, relations. And as in many areas of the book, uh, re really throughout in a sense, I try to break down what I consider to be unnecessary oppositions or false dichotomies, or not entirely false. It's not that there aren't any uh, bases for difference, but the point that I try to argue is that both elements uh, of the uh, supposed opposition are necessary. And uh, that, that you can't have a successful revolution without having a thoroughly mobilized popular base uh, taking the initiative and so on. And you also can't have it without, uh, without leadership. And the, the question is the, the relationships between the two. So, so this, is, uh, this was another issue. Uh, the, uh, there's a chapter about lesser evil. And I have to say that um, both the chapter on lesser evil and the chapter on uh, humanity and nature originated as articles for the Historical Critical Dictionary of Marxism uh, based in Germany, which is something I've been involved with since 1996, uh, which has done a, sort of, an extraordinary job of trying to collect uh, insights uh, over this whole span of issues of, of concern to Marxists for, for generations. Uh, so, uh, but in any case, the, the, the lesser evil is a one, issue is one that we continue to face. And, and I had occasion in the during the course of the 2020 campaign to refer back to what I had, had learned uh, doing the research for that piece, because uh, how, how Marx, although in, in principle uh, opposed to what we call lesser evilism and, and insistent on building up the, uh, the independent strength of the working class party, nonetheless recognized it in certain instances where the, the, the whole question of how they could operate was at issue that it might be necessary to make a concession and ally provisionally, momentarily, with certain elements of the of the capitalist class. And there's a whole uh, additional discussion in there that I won't go into in detail here, unless you want to get into it in, in the discussion. But that's another example of of something that I got, in, got into. And then there are chapters about um, Latin American Revolution, which uh, all of which uh, were uh, based on film reviews that that I had been asked to do for for Jump Cut, which is an amazing publication still coming out just online, ejumpcut.org, uh, Radical Media. But uh, they it, it gave me an opportunity to talk about uh, Cuba, uh, about the revolutions in the Andes, uh, and, and about the case of Chile. And then uh, also in this, this, uh, from film reviews uh, to discuss the experience of, of Black America, uh, from Black liberation to mass incarceration, uh, in the form of uh, reviewing a, a film about the Black Panther Party and reviewing also the more recent film 13th about, uh, about the prison uh, situation. And then, then finally, the book has a, a section, uh, a chapter about labor song. And I, I credit my interest in this uh, in part to, to my good fortune of having been able to teach for the last 25 years at the Berkeley College of Music. And having music students and being able to talk about politics is, I think, a rare uh, privilege for which I uh, count myself uh, extremely fortunate and makes me, makes me want to keep going despite Zoom and, and everything of that sort. And, and then uh, there's a concluding chapter in which I try to uh, weave together themes of the various preceding discussions. Uh, and and the, the, the common theme that I find throughout is, is again, this idea of trying to uh, overcome oppositions that don't necessarily have to exist, or let's say instances where 
people should recognize the viability of the position different from theirs, as in the case of the top down and bottom up uh, approaches to the taking of power or uh, humanity and nature. That, that should one be concerned with nature or concerned with humanity? And that's a, obviously a false dichotomy because they're, they're, they're interdependent. But then, then also a quick reminder in that uh, final chapter of, of something that I mentioned at the beginning, which is I'm always, uh, although the chapter begins with a kind of rather uh, gloomy uh, outlook uh, about the, the prospects that we all face, nonetheless a reminder of the positive elements that have shown themselves at various points uh, throughout, in which I mentioned most recently in the case of the Chilean uh, constitutional convention, but uh, which I, I mentioned there, the, uh, actually the examples from the instances of workers' control that I discussed in that chapter, which uh, is a, a, an invocation or a, uh, let's say, a rediscovery of, of the extraordinary initiatives that were undertaken by ordinary people in revolutionary times, uh, which showed people are capable of doing much more than one thinks they can do on the basis of what uh, their day-to-day -day conditions uh, impose on them in, in capitalist society. Uh, another example that I mentioned there in, in, in closing uh, that I had alluded to in my film review chapter of Latin America is the quite remarkable example of the Cuban ethic of service, which really does uh, permeate the society and accounts for its extraordinary role internationally in disaster relief, health, work, and, and so on. So that there's a basis for hope in this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, human potential that you can see arising in certain circumstances, uh, which uh, has not been, uh, yeah, is, is, kept, is kept in the background, let's say, and a lot of people are not aware of it. We have to be reminded of it. So uh, in this moment of enormous, uh, well, uh, horrors coming out of the thinking of the recent attacks on Gaza and so on, uh, the, the, the resilience uh, that nonetheless exists in certain peoples and that I've witnessed among prisoners and then again in these examples like of workers control and, and now uh, the, the case of Chile, which I knew directly, uh, these provide the basis for some, some inspiration. So I think that maybe that's, that's enough for me to uh, give just by way of introduction to what I hope will be a, a, a lively discussion. We can go on to any issues, whether it's uh, about the, uh, the book or, or about issues uh, suggested or related to themes that I've mentioned so far. Thank you, Victor. So we, uh, what we'd like to do is have people write stack in chat, but if you raise your hand in the window, we'll try to call on you in the same sequence. There is plenty of time for everybody. So if the sequence is off, you'll still get to ask your question. So uh, that was, uh, Victor, you had said conversation. You d did quite a, a comprehensive overview of the book and uh, it should give us much to talk about. So um, there is David and Margaret did uh, ask, um, or they made the comment we could finally use the word capitalist and found this liberating. Any comment from you on that? Uh, could you explain what you may have to have liberating? David and Margaret to say what they. Uh, you could elaborate on your question. David, Margaret. Hi. Um, I just, uh, it, it, your friend forgot to say in 1990. In 1990, in relation to your article about the Soviet Union, um, we could finally use the word capitalist after that, meaning ca the capitalist system could be objectified and thus more easily described in the mainstream. And that's what I found liberating. So I just uh, asked if you had any comments. Yes, uh, actually, what it does suggest to me is a point that has been made by uh, Richard Wolff, whose work many of you may know. He has a, a, does this economic update and frequent podcasts. Uh, but he, uh, he's been lecturing uh, since, uh, since the 60s about, uh, about capitalism. And he said that uh, 
un until the economic meltdown of 2008, uh, whenever he would lecture about capitalism to a general audience, there'd always be some people who would object to his uh, criticisms. Uh, but since that time, he's, he encounters virtually nothing in the form of objections like that, that the people, since that meltdown, uh, everybody really knows that capitalism doesn't work for the majority of the people. And, and, it, and, and the, the case is, is therefore fairly easy to make. And this reminds me also of, of a larger point to make that, you know, what, what is simple and what is complicated about the things that we do? I, I think what's, what's simple is the uh, perception of the failure of capitalism. Uh, what's complicated, of course, is the question of, of how you overcome it. But uh, this uh, has been a major shift. And I think uh, it, it has been since that meltdown of 2008 that there has been a, a fertile ground in this country for the development of, uh, of a popular movement towards socialism. Yeah, thanks, Victor. I, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. George Rousseau has asked, Victor, can you say something about the intersection of capitalism and climate control? The climate control. Uh, well, if, if by climate control, you mean things like air conditioning, that sort of thing. Uh, yes, uh, very much so. I mean, the, uh, I mean, the basic assumption of capitalism is that uh, uh, hu humans can control the natural world. Uh, setting up uh, major activities in, in extremely hot places is no problem because you can have air conditioning, uh, and and you can you can sit in an office all day and imagine and be in in comfort uh, and and uh, disregard the conditions outside. And of course, this is a, a typical contradictory element because all the energy that's required in order to do that exacerbates the problem that, uh, uh, that exists in the, in the first place. And that in order to have a, let's say, a rational form of climate control, one of the things I'm reminded of is a, uh, an essay that uh, Richard Levins wrote uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago about, about shade, you know, the, the, the politics of shade and the extraordinary benefits of, of trees uh, in just uh, controlling climate. So, so you might say that a, a non-capitalist form of, of climate control is uh, vegetation. And, and also you might say the, the kind of architecture that's possible in hot climates. I mean, I, I had a revelation, of course, uh, when I spent a month in Nicaragua in 1984 and I stayed with a friend there. And of course, uh, Nicaragua is a warm, uh, uh, in a warm zone and uh, the house, the walls did not go up to the to the top of the uh, up to the roof. The, the roof is, uh, extended over the tops of the walls, but with a gap in between. And the house was really remarkably cool, even though there was no uh, air conditioning installed. So, uh, and and uh, with the sort of using stone floors and that that sort of thing. So, uh, you might say that that's a non-capitalist form of of climate control, as opposed to the capitalist form. The capitalist form is, is energy intensive, and that's the problem with it. I don't know if that's exactly what you had in mind with your question, but uh, uh, a, another dimension might be considered whether there's a, 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 an approach to the uh, in global warming itself that's uh, sponsored by capitalism, and that indeed there is. There are all kinds of uh, devices uh, that are proposed uh, of uh, sort of really playing tricks on the natural environment, uh, like by uh, by propelling objects into the air to uh, to interfere with the rays of the sun and so on. And and all of these, uh, I think the common denominator of all of them is that they're designed to reduce the extent of global warming without cutting back on the basic activities that contribute to global warming and which have a lot of other disadvantages as well. Yeah. I was thinking about the latter. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. So we have Peter Rennes who has a question. What? Uh, go ahead, Peter. Hi, Victor. Hi, Peter. Uh, I wanted to ask you whether you thought that um, there was any future for bottom-up cooperatives because you mentioned bottom-up and top-down, and I've been pushing for bottom up and sometimes I get very skeptical and a little depressed about their future. 
That's the first question. The second is a comment. You probably know this. In Cuba, uh, Fidel was a bourgeois nationalist. And after the Bay of Pigs in, I think, April 61, he said, this is now a socialist revolution. And in December 61, he said, I realize I've been a Marxist-Leninist from the day I was born. So I wonder what your comments are about that transition from national bourgeois to revolutionary. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I, I, I guess you would say he was national bourgeois in the, in the sense that he was pursuing a legal career uh, prior to the time that he uh, really became uh, uh, active, but but no, but even while he was uh, pursuing his legal career, uh, I think he he still had radical uh, inclinations, although perhaps not yet uh, beyond uh, the uh, bourgeois national in the sense of of a kind of uh, striving for independence from U U.S. control or, over Cuba. But uh, I, I think he said that in '61 that he was. He would be a Marxist uh, Leninist until the day he died. I don't think he said it, that it was from the day he was born. Uh, but uh, in, in any case, he, uh, it, I think he's he was, been a Marxist Leninist all my life. I didn't realize it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but both he and his brother were the offspring of a landowner uh, in a relationship with a, uh, with a woman who was in a uh, subordinate, let's say, social capacity. And they may, may have, that may have. Uh, sensitized them, uh, uh, maybe in ways comparable to the way I felt uh, sensitized to social injustices. That you see the, you see the the hierarchy within your own household, and 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 this is this is upsetting. Uh, that that's just speculation, so far as Fidel is concerned. As for co-ops uh, generally, uh, yeah, I, this is a continuing uh, striving, and, it, and there's a, a lot of uh, I find uh, you well, you know more about this than I do because uh, you've studied it quite a lot. But, uh, but the point that I made in, in this, uh, my study of, of workers' control and revolution is that the, the revolutionary moment is one that creates a, a sense among ordinary people of opportunity to do things uh, that they hadn't thought themselves capable of doing before that. And so that would be a moment in which these new types of social organization could come into play. And I know that was the case in, in Chile during the years of, of Allende, because even though Allende was not, uh, when elected president in 1970, was not particularly uh, pushing co-ops, that, the, uh, that it, the, the whole society was in a kind of crisis of, of opportunity. And there was uh, sp spontaneous acts of organization uh, in the population, whether it was uh, uh, for production or for consumption, especially. I mean, one thing I know in particular uh, uh, is about the uh, price control organizations that they formed in the, in the popular neighborhoods. And these were cooperative organizations. So the thing is, you might say there's a dialectic between the political process that leads to a moment of crisis and the, the uh, development of the capacity, or let's say the expression of the uh, already existing capacity of people to take the initiative and act on their own, where previously they had thought that uh, they hadn't thought that any such thing was possible. Suddenly, they see a, a realm of, of possibilities. So yeah, it, I mean, it's it's hard to project in in, in general, but I think that uh, I mean, when we think of the degree of change that is necessary in order to combat the environmental breakdown, uh, it involves transformation of entire ways of life. Uh, in the direction of reduced energy, uh, uh, reconfiguration of space, and so on. And that type of activity uh, involves, by its very nature, uh, creative steps taken by people uh, in every sphere of society. And the, the, the most natural, and this has to be done cooperatively, I would say. So, but may, maybe you can say more about that because uh, the, uh, the the co-ops. I, I know there have been uh, ups and downs, and you've written about the co-ops in in Argentina, which were uh, very impressive in the early twenty first century. And uh, I don't know what's what's become of them since then. But uh, and and Gar Alperovitz has written a lot about co-ops in the United States uh, on, on a small scale, but uh, in great numbers though. 
So Inez has asked, <clears throat> the latest issue of Yes Magazine reports 71% of carbon emissions is produced by only 100 large corporations. Coca-Cola is the world's largest producer of plastic waste. Given this, what can individuals do about the climate emergency, perhaps organize targeted boycotts? That's... Yeah. Uh, organized targeted boycotts uh, could be could be good, uh, but but I would say also at the same time, uh, the larger process of building up a political organization uh, that would uh, ultimately expropriate uh, corporations that do those types of things. So the, uh, the the boycott is one part of of such a process. You might say it's the it's the the bottom up part perhaps, but. Uh, uh, ultimately, the, uh, it's a question of taking power away from those who determine the configuration of production in this society. And that does involve expropriation. And, and to get to the point where expropriation is possible, you have to win power politically. And, and that's where the whole uh, larger challenge of, of building up a, a, a socialist organization that can contend for power and eventually can win power. And I, I know that this is a, a terrific challenge uh, in, in the sense that, I mean, just in terms of issues raised in, in, in my book, the process of transition is, is, is such a complex one. Uh, it involves, uh, it might involve sudden moments of drastic uh, power uh, transition, but it also involves a slow buildup over time. And we're confronted with a situation now, however, where because of the severity and the urgency of the environmental crisis, we don't have the time for that type of thing. To, so that's why a, a new level of popular understanding and awareness has to be developed uh, with, with great urgency, that, that all the uh, phenomena of uh, sort of human intervention that we've seen in moments of crisis, we have to, we collectively, all of us, uh, have to see this as a moment of crisis. And, and that's perhaps the, uh, the, the challenge, you know, that the people say, well, it won't happen until, uh, until people are directly affected. Well, how do you define what it, what is, what it is to be directly affected? And I think that um, what we're seeing, cer certainly in a physical sense, is that the effect of the cumulative buildup of the environmental dangers over time has reached a point where there can be sudden increases in the immediate suffering of, of, of people. And I'm thinking most obviously of, of dramatic flooding uh, at the moment of, of, of a huge increase in the, in the amount of, uh, well, let's say the ice that comes off land base, the, the base that goes into the sea. But the point is, uh, there's a kind of suddenness uh, of the, prospect of such catastrophe, which gives an urgency to, uh, to revolution uh, that uh, hasn't existed before at that level in, in terms of affecting everybody. Let's say it's, one can say that it's always urgent in terms of the intolerable conditions that many people face in their own lives. But in terms of the objective uh, threat to continued human existence, uh, there has never been an urgency like there is at the moment. So uh, it, it is a moment of calling for uh, an unusual level of, um, let's say, scope and depth and intensity of, of revolutionary activity, uh, which is, uh, again, that's a huge challenge. We, we see the elements of it, and that's what I, one of the things I try to do in the book is it look at all possible suggestions of where we might find this, uh, but it's, it's a continuing search, and, and uh, the process of developing it I mean, we're finding perhaps a response among uh, much younger people at the present time who, who are aware of the dangers that they face in their own lives. And the question of how to organize all of this uh, is, is one that uh, faces all of us. And, and I suppose that what the, the uh, discussions in my book do is try to uh, bring back to our attention various ways in which this uh, type of organization has been 
uh, developed and out of what kinds of concerns it has been developed at different moments and raising the question of how, how we can combine the sort of the accumulated insights of all these experiences uh, to form the basis of a, uh, of, of a movement that'll, that'll sweep away really the, uh, the, the dominant forces. Now, I, I know th those are speaking in grandiose terms, but, but I, I think that what I keep having to emphasize, and, and I think we all need to in, in every possible forum, is the, the urgency of, of the process that, uh, is, that we're called upon to, uh, to address. So I, uh, there's a very longer question from Joe Ramsey and uh, I am calling on Joe to state his question. Go ahead, Joe. All right, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Sorry, I'm outside here. Victor, it's great to see you. Thank you for all your work and for this talk and book in particular trying to stay away from traffic as I speak this. So my question, as you can see in the chat, is about the particular uh, role or challenges facing socialist, perhaps Marxist, uh, socialist or communist educators in this moment. I mean, you've had a long history of engagement, uh, both in the academy and in correspondence with prisoners, both uh, inside the United States and without. And I just wondered if you might crystallize um, for us um, concentrate for us some of your insights as to the um, the particular kind of challenges or the opportunities facing socialist educators in the current moment. Um, I mean, I take it from your previous responses, you know, the, the re recurrent frequency of kind of false oppositions, right, uh, that you, your work helps to kind of melt. But I'm, I'm kind of curious, basically, like, what, it, what would you say if you could sum up for us to some of the, do you, do, when you're trying to educate uh, in a socialist direction with in correspondence with prisoners versus students at, at Berkeley College of Music, what are the differences? What are the different kind of challenges that you see that shut down kind of what might be uh, potential? And what are the places where you see things opening up in ways that might, uh, you know, uh, that people could maybe be on alert for as we, you know, continue to try to sustain this, uh, this project in the belly of the beast? Well, thank you for that question, Joe. It's a, it's a big one. I, I would say that uh, among the prisoners who are interested, uh, there's, there's an extraordinary receptivity. But, but I mean, the, but actually, uh, the, the process is uh, not just, just my own. I mean, say, say I, I have contact with a number of prisoners, and, and several of them are themselves engaging in, in educational practice. And what they do is, uh, is uh, every bit as important, if not more so than, than what I do. I, I can provide resources, but I'm not uh, with them on a day-to-day -day basis as they are with their fellow prisoners. And uh, I, I must say that uh, I've been amazed by the reports I've heard from, uh, uh, well, let's say uh, three, uh, three different prisoners of, uh, who have asked me to send copies of, uh, actually, it's my book, Democracy Denied, especially, but also the earlier Red Green Revolution uh, to some of their uh, fellow prisoners. And uh, they're uh, e exceptionally uh, motivated. So, 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 so that's uh, obvious. I mean, as far as the Berkeley College of Music is concerned, uh, again, I, I feel it's, it's a little bit of a special case in the sense that um, musicians, uh, music students are uh, I'd say compared to the average student body, uh, college student body in this country, uh, maybe uh, I would say a little more open-minded perhaps. I, I, I can't tell in, in, entirely. Uh, but but I, I think there, there is a, a great hunger uh, for insight. I'd say there's, there's a disposition to be critical. But I think the, the biggest lack actually is in terms of resources uh, with which to keep themselves informed on a day-to-day -day basis. That, that even people who are fully aware uh, or, or let's say fully um, upset by the conditions surrounding them, uh, they don't uh, typically have the media type resources to give them analysis and information that's necessary in order to address this. And so, so I think what, one of the biggest things that I can tell them about. And one of the biggest things they take away from, from the class, I think, is just exposure to different media sources that keep them informed about uh, all the, uh, not only all the things that are taking place, 
but about ways of analyzing and understanding them and, and sort of deconstructing the interpretations that they are given by the mainstream uh, corporate media. So I, I don't know in general, in terms of role of educators, if there's more that I can say than that. Uh, I, I, I guess the, the other thing I would mention though, and, and th this might be a suggestion that uh, uh, of interest to you, uh, that I think it's helpful if educators themselves get organized. And my model for this is actually the organization that I was uh, a member of in the late 60s and early 70s. It had a, a brief but influential existence, which is called the New University Conference. And that was a, a, an organization which had, I think, an influence out of proportion to its numbers because it, it provided resources to educators and uh, provided them a community uh, that they could refer back to. And what they had in common was a kind of uh, broadly, <clears throat> broadly Marxist political outlook, but um, it encouraged them, for example, uh, to go into uh, community colleges, uh, uh, commuter campuses and that type of thing. And it encouraged also a, a democratic approach to, to teaching. And I, and I think, the, so, it, so it's a question not just of the substance of what you're imparting, but also of the structures that you put in place. And, of, and this is a point I, I've heard you make too, that uh, you learn from your students as well as your, the students learning from you. Uh, but what you as a, as a teacher want to learn from your students is about their lives and the circumstances they confront. And, uh, and, and you're offered the challenge of how, how to uh, interpret all that in, in ways that uh, contribute to the uh, political development uh, of the students. So I'd say, uh, yeah, the, the teachers themselves should organize and, and that's part of the larger process of organization. Uh, if we're talking about building a revolutionary movement, it includes every sector of society organizing. Of course, that's long been recognized in terms of the labor movement generally. Uh, in terms of, of educators, uh, the organizations that they do have, like the, the AFT or the NEA, they're, they're, not, uh, they're not revolutionary organizations. So you, you might say one needs a, a revolutionary organi organization of teachers. Again, you'd say, I would mm. say NUC number two or something like that. Uh, we don't have to call it the same name again, but uh, they had uh, important ideas that they put forward. And I, I think it, it inspired a lot of us. It certainly was important to me at a crucial moment at the beginning of my uh, teaching career. Thank you, Victor. Revolutionary Organization of Teachers. I like it. ROT. We got to take out the rot. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Marge, your question is another one that's been known fairly well. So, uh, have you asked your question? Need to unmute. Somebody has a noise in the background. Marge, you need to unmute. Uh, Steve? Yeah, I think Marge and Steve, yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. uh, yeah I, I have to confess uh, somewhat shamefacedly that um, it's me, not Marge. I'm using my wife's computer. She's here, but it's me that had the question. And I can't actually read it, so I'm going to have to try and remember it. Um, um, I, I can read it. That, that, that's okay. You asked, could you comment on the varieties of oppression? Class is based on an all too real uh, uh, division of humanity by economic means. Race is entirely artificial. Sex is not because of different <laughs> reproduction, <clears throat> which I put different demands on the collective. Class and sex seem therefore fundamental, whereas other divisions less so. Would you agree? And what are the backgrounds for resistance? Well, I, I would disagree on in one dimension is that the diff, while it's the real difference between the sexes, uh, it's not a difference that inherently implies subjugation. The subjugation was uh, historically created uh, and, and instilled. Uh, uh, 
whereas whereas class again, as I said, is by definition a relationship of su subjugation. So so the challenge with with all the other uh, dimensions of oppression is to to undo the let's say whatever is artificially uh, imposed, and that's uh, that's the challenge in, in, in terms you know changing the the changing the stereotypical uh, conceptions of what's associated with with e each of the sexes, uh, changing the uh, uh, sense of, of, of obligation. Uh, and, and I mean, from the beginning, it's been recognized that uh, in order to achieve this fully, uh, it's not something that can be done just on a private individual level. It requires social support of one kind or another. Uh, in particular, uh, for example, uh, community child care support uh, and community uh, provision of various kinds of services so that there's not an overwhelming concentration of, of burdens, which uh, if the, the economic situation is unfavorable can, can disproportionately affect one or other of the partners in a, in a household. So, uh, so the, the household or whatever living unit uh, there has to be a sense of equality uh, among those who make it up, um, but this can be helped and sometimes depends uh, uh, significantly on the outside uh, social support that can be created. I don't know if that sufficiently answers your question, because I mean one can talk about all the, the other various uh, forms of uh, excuses or pretexts that are used to uh, subjugate or discriminate against uh, sectors of the population, like whether it's disability or age or uh, 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 sexual orientation and so on. Uh, I mean, in, in every case, there may be involved a, a kind of partly an educational cultural drive to, uh, to get over the, the sense, but, but partly also the provision of certain services. So like for, for disability and sometimes uh, uh, age, age and disability sometimes uh, uh, go together. That in, in the sense, sometimes if one loses certain facilities, uh, certain aptitudes uh, with, with age, or whether it's that or some other kind of disability. There, it's the burden should be also on the society to to make up for that. So you have the uh, uh, sort of uh, having having buses so that they can accommodate wheelchairs and and, and that type of thing. Uh, or, so in in other words. The, it has to be understood that the overcoming of the disadvantages of the various sectors uh, have, has to be seen as a social project. But there's not, the point is, the general point is that there's nothing inherent about any of these dimensions uh, that are used to uh, downgrade people. There's nothing inherent in, in them to uh, imply a downgrading uh, that, that it, it may be made up for by certain steps that can be taken socially as well as uh, by changes in individual attitudes. Uh, perhaps I could say where I was coming from with this question. Originally, I was resisting uh, identity politics. Yes. I was saying that, you know, class is, is real. Class is imposed on us, but it's very, very real. But um, then I began to think and also talk to comrades and colleagues who some of them were female, and they pointed out that there was a real difference. I mean, it's not gender, it's sex. You know? mm -hmm. that the difference between me and the person with a wound is different in the terms of the types of demands that we may have to make during our lives on the collective. Whereas, you know, for instance, this afternoon, we were having a discussion on, on, the, on whatever it's called, this what we're doing now, on Zoom uh, with... Uh, two friends, one of my wife, uh, who's female, and, and another friend who's black. And I thought, well, you know, between me and Victor, uh, sorry, between me and Patrick, although he's a little younger than me, there's no real difference. The difference between us is imposed, completely imposed. Uh, whereas the difference between myself and Marge is real. Uh, you know, she, she has a womb, uh, she used it, she produced two children, and that places demands on the collective, um, which the collective has a responsibility to meet. So there are real differences, whereas other, some of the types of oppression are absolutely imaginary. Race is completely imaginary, you know. Yeah, right, right. 
The, the, but the point is, uh, it, difference is one thing and subjugation is another. You can be different without being uh, superior or subordinate in power uh, to, to the other. The, the, there's no reason why the difference, which is very real, should imply the supremacy of one over the other. That's, that's all I'm saying. I, obviously, I agree. I wouldn't be here if I didn't. It does make one think through the different forms of repression and and how to combat them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Jim Paul, were you raising your hand in response to this question or another, we have about five other people with questions. Are you addressing this in particular, Jim? Jim, are you addressing this question in particular? You have to unmute. No, this is another question. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll get it to you in sequence. Thank uh, you. Jo Johanna Fernandez, uh, you have a question on, uh, go ahead. Hey, yes, I, I wrote it down and it's pretty basic. I just wanted to, to hear uh, more specifics on the examples of workers' power you highlighted in the book uh, and maybe why you highlighted it. Um, I know it probably has a lot to do with your interest in travel in Latin America, but I also wanted to add that uh, that it was really Occupy Wall Street even before um, the last deep recession that uh, that popularized critiques of capitalism that that made uh, critiquing capitalism acceptable in American society. And just wanted to add that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely right on the Occupy Wall Street. And I say, say that was, uh, I mean, I mentioned the meltdown of 2008. And I think the Occupy Wall Street, which emerged in 2011, was uh, a direct consequence of that, maybe just slightly delayed, but not very much. And it oh, absolutely... right. It, it was before. Uh, it was, I thought, I somehow I thought it was before the meltdown, but no, it was after. Got it. Yeah, right. Yeah. But um, as for, uh, Workers' power uh, examples of the types of, of things that they that they can do. I mean, in the chapter I have on that, uh, I have uh, four cases: the uh, Russia at the time of the revolution, uh, Italy uh, in the 1919 uh, with the time that Gramsci emerged as a leader, uh, Spain during the period of the uh, of the Spanish Civil War and then Chile 1970 to 73. And so, so I go into some detail on each of those cases, but I think that the most impressive to me in terms of the scope of workers' power was that of Spain, uh, the uh, actually anarchist collectives that were formed in the uh, parts of Spain, in Eastern Spain, the, especially Catalonia, the parts that had not yet been overrun by Franco's forces where they had really a thoroughgoing social revolution that took place. And of course, that was also a, 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 an issue of controversy of course, because the, uh, the bourgeois Republican government that was resisting Franco, on the one hand, they depended on the support of, of, uh, of everybody, but on the other hand, uh, they tended to uh, suppress the, the workers uh, and peasants who were forming these collectives and were radically transforming the society. And unfortunately, this was one of the cases where the, where the Soviet assistance uh, came down also against, uh, against the anarchists who really represented the actual revolutionary thrust uh, of that whole process. And, but uh, the kind, in terms of the kinds of things they did, uh, one of the things that especially struck me, I mean, they, they, uh, they collectivized not only uh, industry, but agriculture, and they they established, uh, there's a wonderful book that I cite by Gaston Laval about this, about the collectives, that uh, you no longer defined uh, your work duties in terms of one single job, and that they had uh, arrangements whereby seasonally people could shift from one kind of work to another so that uh, agricultural workers in the off season could shift over to some kind of manufacturing operation and so on. And all that could be organized on the basis of uh, collective arrangements. So it, it was a great sort of outpouring of initiative uh, from below that was, uh, that was very impressive. Thank you, Victor. We have in sequence, David Worley, Dave B, and then James Paul. 
but it each has been, uh, I, I haven't seen Jim's question, but David and Dave have uh, longer questions. Go ahead, David Worley. Hi, Victor, thanks. Uh, nice to see you again. I was, uh, you know, the, the recent, uh, the movement in Chile in the last couple of years is much, very much underreported in, uh, in our, the media here in the States. And, and it's really, to me, it, it's, I wish I knew more about it because it's one of the most, I feel it's one of the most important examples that we have of how, you know, a, a society can be turned around pretty fast uh, by a popular movement. Um, and, uh, and I'm also pretty inspired by the fact that, uh, since, since progressive forces have won a two, more than two thirds majority in this, uh, constitutional convention, the right will not be able to use their minority to block progressive things. Now, that doesn't mean we don't know what's going to come out of that convention in terms of creating institutions for popular power. I was interested in maybe you might know more about this and could comment on two things. First of all, obviously, the, the popular, the progressive forces in Chile probably have the same divisions more or less that we always have, you know, between ultra leftist anarchist types, uh, you know, Marxist sectarian, Marxist party sectarian types, uh, and maybe, you know, more just uh, liberal do-gooder types. And a lot of times those, uh, those disunion, this, that disunity can be just as, you know, poisonous as, um, as the attacks from the, uh, from the openly conservative forces. And I was wondering if you could comment on what the situation is now in Chile. So I think most of the old political parties that were there in the 70s that we all knew about, you know, the CP, the SP and the MIR are not uh, exactly the same forces. And the other thing is, is the, is the movement in Chile any better protected uh, against uh, violent, uh, repression of whatever new constitution is proposed than than Chile was than the movement was in the seventies in Chile. Yeah, uh, well, I wish I knew more about the actual situation in Chile. Uh, it's uh, really something that we need to f follow uh, carefully. One thing I do know is that the mayor who was recently elected in the same election that produced the Constituent Assembly was a member of the Communist Party, so the, the, that party still exists. Uh, of course, as you know, the, there were a lot of these uh, sectarian uh, divisions in the period of, of Allende. I, I don't know whether they have disappeared. I, I have the impression, though, that the way in which the Constituent Assembly election was organized was not around parties, which that, that's an interesting point, but around sectors of society. So, so sectors defined really by, I guess, by occupation primarily. But... Um, so that's something to keep watching. I wish I could say more about it at this point. Uh, I, and as for the uh, the army, I I, I think uh, my guess would be, and this is a really speculation, uh, that the Chilean military, uh, after all the experience of Pinochet, who was not only brutal and uh, brutal fascist, but was also thoroughly corrupt, as it could turn out in the end, uh, has has suffered some uh, loss of. Uh, loss of prestige and will uh, would think twice and, and would have uh, there'd be more restraints against it uh, at, at this time. But I mean, uh, it, everywhere it's difficult. I mean, I, I'm thinking especially also of the, the comparable case of Venezuela, which seemed much better placed than Allende's Chile to carry through a transformation since they, since Hugo Chavez had been in the military and he had more or less uh, satisfied the military and, and uh, in the sense of uh, getting it uh, finally on, on his side. Uh, but nonetheless, the, uh, the response from the, uh, from the bourgeoisie and from the United States was so uh, enormous uh, that it's, it's, uh, it succeeded in, uh, at least in creating a devastating situation in Venezuela. But I, I think uh, in a larger sense, uh, we can see that uh, the popular movements have been arising again in, in many of the countries. And uh, there's a mutual dependence uh, of them that, that the repressive forces can't uh, uh, be deployed everywhere at once, let's say at least insofar as they come from outside the country. 
So uh, this has to keep going. I mean, that that if uh, I mean the, the there's a tremendous uprising you all probably heard about in recent weeks in Colombia, um, which uh, up to now has had a, you know thoroughly conservative governments, but the uh, the outrage and the rejection of the, of the conservative regime is extraordinary in in Colombia. So so I think uh, you know these movements uh, draw from one another to a certain extent and uh, create. Uh, a climate again where people feel the the power of example and, and the inspiration of seeing other people doing this what my friend uh, George Katsiafikas calls the eros effect uh, coming into play uh, uh, so so uh, yes uh, in terms of the sectarian divisions I think we have to I, I think have some confidence that the uh, sectoral organization which is more concrete and less ideological might be a good start uh, to uh, to overcoming that. Dave B has a, a, a question that went over three dialogue boxes. So Dave B, I'm calling on you to state your question. Uh, you know, you know, I think I mean, I think pretty much, you know, that I, I was I think Dave Dave Worley kind of answered some of it, and and I, maybe and Victor has uh, has answered a lot of what I was asking about. I mean, that I'm trying to understand the situation in Chile, which is uh, complex. I I would almost amend, you know, I would change the question to say like, uh, do people know which which economic which banks which which industries which economies are connected to uh, you know, are majorly connected to Chile and the United States and or the geography of those uh, trade routes and bank connections between, you know, between, uh, you know, Washington, Miami, Mexico City and, and Chile that probably would inform some of the tactics there. But, yeah. yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I don't know about uh, particular banks and that sort of thing. I. I I just know that in general, uh, it's commonplace among the bourgeoisies of those countries to uh, uh, store a lot of their wealth outside the country, including, well, notably in Miami. This is, um, there's a whole uh, study of these types of things. I don't know to what extent it, it involves uh, capital from Latin American countries. I was just reading this new book by Chuck Collins called The Wealth Hoarders. Uh, if you want to learn about that whole dimension of financial activity, that's a, that's a very good source. Thank you, Victor. Uh, James Paul, you can ask your question now. Uh, thank you very much and thanks to Victor for this uh, wonderful discussion. Um, yeah, as uh, I think about the um, consumption of various things, uh, that uh, is uh, leading us to uh, the, you know, the, the possible end of uh, living existence on the planet. And I hear constantly over here people having discussions about uh, automobiles. And this is discussions about their, their addictions, you might say, uh, automobiles and uh, homes and, uh, and uh, particular things that they covet. And uh, uh, there's this, this, this such an intensity of interest about and focus on the acquisition of these material things. And so it seems to me that this is a, this is a big, very big barrier. Uh, and this, this, this addiction goes down through the uh, social system pretty far. I mean, it seems to me anyway that although people who are relatively poor don't, can't acquire these things, nonetheless, they aspire to them, they wish they had them, mm -hmm. they can, uh, they'll buy them on time if possible and so on. So what I'm saying to Victor is, so how, um, how do we work to break this, this magic and uh, uh, and get people thinking about how much nicer it would be to live differently and of course to live at all. I mean to have a planet uh, that we can live in uh, 
in a, in a few years' time. Mm. Well, yes, <laughs> uh, consumerism. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I I I think it, this is this is where you come to the notion of of a cultural transformation, uh, and there does have to be a transformation in the culture, so that uh, one gets away from this. And this is uh, the the political educators that uh, that Joe spoke of uh, can come into play here, um, and uh, and I and I think that uh, one of the themes of the political education uh, has to be the environmental focus. I mean the the explanation of of how this is simply unsustainable, and uh, I mean it's a it's a great challenge, and I mean and this is one of the reasons why I was. <clears throat> interested in the musical expressions because I, I recognize as, as I'm sure all of us do that merely arguing with people about you shouldn't do this because it's destroying the planet. Uh, well, it, that, that it's important to have those arguments, but it's not enough. A, lo a lot of people will not uh, respond to that. So if there can be some kind of way of <clears throat> communicating with them that does not just depend on that type of uh, expression, uh, that would certainly help. Uh, the other thing that's important, again, always, is is the the process of organizing. You know that the, the the consumer habits uh, are not just um, the uh, a product of of individual foibles. I mean, it, in other words, the classic example is uh, buying a car or buying any of these appliances. Uh, these appliances, which are uh, such that you you have to own them individually, so there has to be a social organization uh, that enables you not to have to do that. So, and with the the car, of course, the obvious thing is to have a more not only more thorough system of public transportation, but also have reconfigured communities so that you don't have to go such distances and that type of thing. So it's it's a multi pronged attack. So so the argument is just part of it. The cultural expression is part of it the reorganization of society so that people are less dependent on these things. And then, uh, and I suppose just thinking more about the possible uh, cultural transformation is uh, imaginative ways of, of portraying the absurdity of some of the consumer habits that, that we have. And th this is a challenge to creative artists in a way that, uh, that I think needs to be taken up. But those are, those are some ideas. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Uh, 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 Michael, could I interrupt? This is George. Yes, George, do you have a question? Uh, um, I, have to, I have to leave right now. Uh, someone has come. So I'm, I'm sorry. I, could I just make a, a comment? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. So, uh, Victor, I, 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 I think the rest of you don't know that Victor and I talked for many years together at Berkeley. And, uh, nice to he, see you again, George. It's been a long time. It has, Victor, right. So, and uh, Victor was, uh, for me, and still is a great beacon and a great, great font of, uh, of uh, very important information. And I just wanted to say, Victor, that you are, these books that you have produced, uh, they, to me, constitute a great legacy. And uh, I want to express my gratitude. Uh, you know, as you know, I'm writing a book on uh, what I'm calling the digital revolution, which deals, you know, precisely with uh, a lot of the issues that have come up. You know. So I, I just uh, before I leave, I just wanted to tell you how much I have always appreciated what you have done and and what you're leaving for others to benefit from. Thank you so much, George. I really appreciate your comment, and it, it, I've I've learned a lot from you as well. And uh, and, and Victor, you don't look too much older. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so long. Goodbye. There is no one else on stack, and I will ask you something, Victor. You mm -hmm. are. This book that we're talking about today is published in the Marx. Engels' Marxisms series. And some of us have seen the plural added to Marxism before. However, the, there's quite a conscious 
aspect to this whole series Paul Grave is doing. And your book seems to really be a, a, a more essential in that kind of ideation than many of the other books I see on the list. Is there a, a way that you could speak to what, uh, why it is important that your book is in a series on Marx-isms as a plural? Well, uh, it, it's appropriate in the sense that uh, there are many different interpretations of Marx and mine is just, uh, mine is just one. And, and mine is not really focused on Marx, but is nonetheless constantly using Marx or uh, making reference to his types of insight and to the methods uh, that he used. So, uh, I mean, for me, the, what I'm happy about is, is just that this, uh, to the extent that this provides an opportunity to um, diffuse my work a little more than it uh, than could be done if it was just by itself. But I think that uh, Marxism's, uh, it reflects the fact that there's continuing uh, discussion and the continuing ferment. There's a series introduction at the beginning of my book uh, by the series editors, and, uh, which is, and that the, the it's like, it reminds me now that you mention it, of the idea of a uh, hundred flowers blooming, that famous phrase of Mao's from the fifties, that, that uh, it, it's a sign of vitality, uh, that there's not just a single line that's coming down, but that there's constant exploration, uh, taking into account many different types of experience and many t different types of input. I, I think you're muted, Michael. I know. David has a follow-up, which is, would a progressive government in Chile be subjected to the same economic and legal warfare as Venezuela has faced? I what think, strategies can we employ to head this off? Yeah, I'm, unfortunately, I, there's absolutely no doubt that it would come under similar types of uh, pressure. Uh, uh, they, they were applying you know, also against Ecuador, as we know uh, recently. Um, and it, it's an absolute uh, constant of US policy to uh, destroy insofar as it can uh, any attempt to create a, uh, a more humane alternative. As for the strategies that can be used, I, I think it's part of the process of, of building up uh, the kind of left political presence, the left party ultimately, uh, that, that has that, uh, that obligation. Um, and I think that um, there's been, uh, no, it, it's interesting to think back, when has non-intervention or anti-intervention uh, been uh, more successful in the United States? And it, it does have some restraining effects, but it's, uh, it's fallen back in recent years. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of the movement against U.S. intervention in Central America in the 1980s. Um, that, uh, that was amazing. Uh, it was amazingly effective that they actually got a, a law passed in Congress uh, making it illegal for the U.S. government to aid the counter-revolutionary forces in Nicaragua. Of course, Reagan uh, went around that, the famous Iran-Contra thing. But the idea that Congress could pass a law uh, outlawing that is... is quite interesting. And in trying to understand how that force was possible, I think what was interesting in that case is, first of all, Nicaragua was not that distant, but secondly, uh, the revolution in that case uh, happened to be uh, very strongly uh, religiously inspired, the, the theology of liberation within the Catholic movement, and that a lot of uh, uh, religious uh, communities in the United States uh, could identify with it directly, and they sent countless delegations. So many people from all over the U.S., and I was living in central Indiana at that time, and, and people I knew from there were, were going and were coming back, so that a lot of ordinary people in the United States had direct exposure to what was being done in, in Nicaragua and were outraged at the idea that the U.S. government would, would be trying to overthrow it. So, uh, of course, Chile is much further away. It's much harder to imagine that type of thing, but it, it gives you an idea of, of the fact that, uh, that people are receptive. And in the, case of, in the case of Chile, it's not particularly religiously inspired or anything like that. But, but I, I think what th that uh, Central American experience does show is that the, it is possible 
to diffuse understanding about these processes uh, in ordinary communities in the, in the United States. And I would say including, including progressive religious communities, uh, uh, among others. So uh, religious communities are significant just because they, they do bring, to, bring people together on a, a regular basis. And, and some of them are quite progressive, especially in the, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the black churches in particular. And I'm sure that uh, so the, uh, the Latino population in the United States has been becoming more and more progressive. They have uh, communities uh, which, which may be appealed to uh, in, in that respect, not only for Chile, but I think for Latin America in general, uh, where movements of this kind, type are going on in, in, in many countries. I mean, there's also a revival uh, in, in Brazil uh, now. And uh, again, there are some Brazilian uh, exile communities, or you might say immigrant communities in the United States. I, so, so I think so, so one idea is to uh, approach the communities co corresponding to those particular countries uh, that exist in the United States, uh, and then also draw them together. So, so this, this, could be, uh, this could be possibly helpful. But I, I think that the basic thing is to educate people in this country as much as possible and to demonstrate that uh, the movements taking place, like the one in Chile right now, uh, represent all the best values, the democratic values that uh, many of us, uh, many people in this country subscribe to. Thank you. Uh, Gordy, I'm going to ask on you, uh, of you to ask your question. Go ahead. Um, yeah, well, I think Victor knows of my interest in uh, uh, single payer health reform. And so the question is sort of where does this movement fit into sort of a, uh, a, a, an anti-capitalist uh, thrust? I mean, on one hand, there's capitalist countries like Canada or Taiwan that have a, a much better, fairer, higher quality more affordable a system where everybody has access to health care. And this has been part of, I think, sort of a propelling the Sanders movement. Um, and obviously, it's something that's needed. And we've extended access under COVID but in very temporary ways. So I wonder how you think about this movement in terms of some of the ideas you're writing about. Well, the idea of, of socialized health care, or even single payer being socialized health insurance, uh, is itself uh, drawn from socialism. It, it doesn't constitute <clears throat> a full socialist arrangement, but it's a socialist idea. So the, the movement in the, in the direction of it has, has been led by socialists. And I, <clears throat> and I think it's an excellent issue on which to advance socialist principles, because uh, healthcare, it seems to me, is a classic example of a service uh, that cannot possibly uh, be sensibly run on the basis of market uh, criteria, uh, according to which uh, the the, uh, the more sophisticated the procedure you have to have, the more you have to pay. And sometimes the most sophisticated procedures, the most expensive procedures may be needed by those who are least able to afford it. And so, so the, the idea of, of uh, charging people uh, for the uh, expense of their uh, individual care is, uh, is on the face of it, uh, nons nonsensical. It, it, it doesn't make sense. But, so, so, but in that sense, the, the idea that, that health care is, is a human right and that it should be decommodified, which is what that's all about, decommodifying is uh, inherently a, a, a socialist principle. So uh, the thing is, uh, I, I guess I would say since in the United States, the resistance to making that reform, even in that one sector of healthcare, whereas it's been accepted and absorbed in other capitalist countries, is an indication that uh, you, one has to go further in this country in the direction of building a large socialist movement uh, in order to, to bring it about. I mean, in, in Britain, the National Health Service was established after World War II when the uh, Labour Party uh, came into power for the first time. And the, the, the Conservative Party had been they were in a situation of scarcity and they'd uh, been discredited. Uh, so, so something uh, on that order is, is necessary. And I think that the health issue is one that touches so many people so closely and where the uh, irrationality of a market-based system is, is so obvious. And, uh, and I think that we've already reached a point where a majority of the population in this country does favor uh, universal health care, but where nonetheless uh, the 
<clears throat> even the Democratic Party uh, has rejected it. And, and uh, I, I was especially struck uh, in the last primary elections when even in that, that Super du Tuesday when, when uh, Bernie Sanders was defeated by Joe Biden, nonetheless in an exit poll, uh, m m there was huge expression of support for single payer healthcare, which is what Bernie Sanders was, was running on. So there's a kind of disconnect that has to be overcome between uh, what people uh, think they uh, need to support politically and what they actually are in favor of. Yeah, that, that's helpful, and I, I, would, I would agree with what you're saying. I mean, the, the level of support and the openings that it provides to expose the irrationality of a marketplace approach for something that shouldn't be a commodity is, is really very powerful. Mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate your, your comment, uh, Gordy, and I, I hope you won't mind if I tell everybody that, that Gordy is, is a doctor and is actually my doctor. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm not allowed to say that, but I, I, I love that you did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but he, Victor is looking alive and well through no uh, doing of mine. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, Victor, any advice for those of us who might move to Indianapolis today? We have, in our experience at the MEP, found there are people from small towns, large towns all over the country who find us on the internet and come in from these kinds of places and, and uh, uh, take part. What was your experience in Indianapolis like, what, 30 years ago, I, I guess is when you left, but do we have hope of reaching people in Indianapolis, which is, I think, a burning question in the US. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was there from 1970 to 1994. and. It's a coincidental, it's wonderful that you asked this question right now because I'm actually making a trip there, a, a, a trip of a few days uh, in two weeks from now, uh, partly to attend the memorial of a friend of mine uh, and to visit several other friends. Um, one of the things that most surprised me in Indianapolis was how radical uh, activists in the Democratic Party there were. That, was, that really astonished me. I, I thought I identified anyone who's a Democrat with the position of the uh, uh, Democrat politicians. And all. No, the, 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 uh, many of them, uh, it, do, since I was a sort of credential in Latin American politics, I had a lot of opportunities to speak during the period of the US involvement with uh, Central America, the Iran, Contra, the Contra things. And I would be uh, sponsored by, let's say, local democratic clubs uh, like that. So, so there, there are people there and they're not, uh, uh, they're not that hard to find. Uh, who were who were very supportive of all this, and also I would say in, in the religious community there, there was a, um, a, a Catholic priest that I got to know there, who who uh, also worked for four years in Nicaragua, and whom I stayed with when I went to Nicaragua. And there's the national headquarters of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, which uh, I, again I hadn't heard of until then. But that's a that's a denomination that happens to be very progressive and has missionaries in Latin America. Very surprising to me uh, to, to find these things. So uh, yes, the, the, there, are, there are people everywhere. <laughs> you just have to find them. I mean, Indianapolis is an odd kind of place. In a way, it's a typical Amer American city built up or expanded around the private automobile. Huge, huge expanse, uh, relatively uh, uh, low density of population. Uh, but um, yeah, there are, there, 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 I'd say that there are people everywhere. The, the one other thing I would mention in that connection is uh, during one, one of my last years there, I was able to invite Howard Zinn to come and speak at our university. He spoke, uh, he drew about three or 400 people to his talk. And uh, he was talking about his visits to all these various places, remote places, uh, uh, even more remote than Indianapolis, and how he would invariably find uh, people who would uh, who were enthusiastically responding to to what he had to say, so so it's uh, there is an enormous uh, untapped uh, reserve of people who are who are <coughs> ready to respond. It's it's a question of having the organizations and the initiative to to seek them out. My follow up is where's that email list, Victor, from that meeting? Well, you from, still have from, it. From the which, email list with those 400 people we could use. Oh, well, well, that was, that was a pre-email days. It was yeah. 1991 or two. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I see Jim. Oh, Jim, J uh, James, James, uh, you have another question. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, the political discourse in the United States is uh, um, very focused on what happens inside the borders of the country uh, politically. Uh, Victor, can you talk to us a little bit about opportunities and possibilities of, of trans-border uh, international uh, work uh, in solidarity with one another? Uh, with people not only in Western Europe, where it might be obvious, but also uh, anywhere else in the world. And for building, since we, clearly we have a, a global uh, capitalists, we need to have a global movement and not just within the United States where the bourgeoisie is especially strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> the organization I know that is most uh, attuned to this uh, is the is called the Alliance for Global Justice and <clears throat> they sponsor uh, solidarity organizations with various countries I think especially throughout Latin America <clears throat> so that that would be one one immediate place but the, I can think of a lot of other things that when I, when you start thinking the um, uh, IFCO Pastors for Peace uh, in, I think it's International Federation of something. Or I, I, I don't, know what, don't know what IFCO stands for. I forget. But they're the, they're the ones who years ago uh, started sending caravans uh, to, of aid to Cuba. And they're still doing it now. I mean, so breaking the sanctions. Uh, so, so there's that, that type of thing. Uh, well, if I might add then a little clarity, because I shouldn't have used the word solidarity maybe because uh, I didn't so much mean uh, in solidarity with, let's say, Latin America or the Middle East, but rather uh, movements that have the same purpose uh, that are in um, countries. I didn't want to limit it to countries that are similar to the United States, but certainly Western Europe gives an opportunity for, for some similarity that might make it easier to bridge, but also countries all over the world, uh, where do we find uh, movements that uh, are like our own in some way and that can give uh, strength and optimism to what we're doing because others are doing it too? Yeah, uh, well, that, that's an interesting question. I, I mean, for, for example, these opportunities come and go, for example. I mean, for, for a while, I was extremely excited and inspired, as I'm sure many of us were, by what was happening in the British Labour Party when Jeremy Corbyn was leading it. Uh, and, and so, so that, that would be ob an obvious example. Um, I, apart from that, uh, yeah, it, it's a, a little bit a question of uh, uh, individual relationships that can be, can be established, but uh, th that, that would be one that comes to mind as, as a, a case where there's a lot of similarity. But, uh, but I, I, I guess the, the idea would be that, that any political organization that, uh, that we form has to have an international arm that is looking out for uh, examples like that. Uh, one other thing that occurs to me that there's a, uh, an outfit uh, called Transform Europe. I mean, again, some of you might know about this, that it does, it's a kind of uh, journal that refers to current political developments of, of the left in Europe. Uh, so, and I mean, they're, they're individual links. I, I mean, I, th I think also, for example, of the German left party. I mean, not that any single one of these parties has the formula, but they're all trying different things. And at least has, it has a certain presence on the national scene in Germany. And there's a, a wonderful journalist who, who writes about it, whom some of you probably know, Victor Grossman, his works appear uh, there. He puts out a bulletin almost every month, and it's sometimes it's usually reproduced on the monthly review uh, website, so that uh, we can at least learn about the conflicts uh, and issues that are being debated in those various organizations and build up our, our knowledge on that basis. So, so his columns would be uh, very a very useful source. So we need an international of some sort. Yeah, yeah. 
I don't know if you would call it a formal international, but well, for example, okay, here's another one, because uh, there have been long, uh, uh, from time to time, there crop up ideas of a fifth international, with you know the third being the communist, the fourth being the Trotskyist. What would what would the fifth be? And there was the idea of, a, of an eco-socialist international, <laughs> and that there is a a, a discussion group. Uh, that, that I join, uh, called the Global Eco-Socialist Network, uh, which actually uh, is, uh, takes advantage of Zoom because they have, uh, they have monthly meetings on um, every continent uh, simultaneously. So that, that's what you can do with Zoom. Uh, they, they have it, uh, I think it's at, uh, they start it on a Sunday at 6 a.m. Pacific time, and then you figure out the rest uh, where everyone else fits in. <laughs> and so, <laughs> um, so, so that kind of thing is possible. And actually this Zoom function uh, facilitates meetings of those because you, you can't meet everyone else without the traveling, without uh, doing that. So, so these things are developing and I think they, they need to be nourished and fed and, and uh, there are growing possibilities like that. So I am going to call on Liz Mestris who is here. Hi, Liz. Liz and I have a long history, as do you and Liz, I think, Victor. Go with <laughs> Liz. Yeah, yeah. Hi, yes, that's wonderful. Uh, um, to see everybody. <laughs> um, I just wanted you to see if you could comment, this is sort of related to the last question, on like the food sovereignty movement, which has been of interest here. Um, I'm now in Mexico, it's different. Um, but um, I was just watching a video on Via Campesinos website today earlier and it um it was on movement building and this is a global organization with over 200,000 members in 80 something countries and they're obviously they're talking about movement building they're talking about capital anti-capitalism they the language itself reminds me of the most socialists that i've known in my life so it's a socialist, it's not charge, challenging political power necessarily, um, but it's just, just saying there has to be a fundamental change on our relation to nature, basically. Um, but to me, it's very interesting. And there's, I mean, others that are like not challenging politically, but that are organized globally are like transition towns, which I find people like that here in Mexico. Um, involved with that and not right where I am, but what do you see of these that are movements that are global and are on the ground um, and pretty much related to environment, but mm -hmm. usually having a left um, orientation? Yeah, oh, well, all I can say is I think there should be more contact uh, among all of us, more contact that sort of that breaks down the uh, specialties between these various things. I mean, the, the big problem of the left in general is, is fragmentation, separation of the different constituencies. And that's what I talk about most in the conclusion to my book. And, and these uh, movements around food and, and, and other uh, indispensable services are uh, clearly uh, have, as you, as you say, a, a, a political thrust. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a way of drawing people into political activity. And the, the idea of, of having uh, the link be drawn between what they're doing and the larger task of building a political organization is, is something that needs to be pushed. Peter Rennes has a follow-up question. Okay. Um, Victor? Yeah. Am I on mute or no? Um, um, I wonder what your thoughts are in Cuba. There's been a proliferation of the Quinta Popistas, uh, far out running cooperative development. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder if you see this as some sort of regression. And there's also the movement of San Isidro, which the Cuban government debunks severely, but I've heard human rights people defending it as a really attempt at um, freedom of expression in the arts field and culture. And I wonder what your thoughts are about both those aspects. Uh, the, the San Isidro thing I'm, I'm not familiar with. What's, do you want to say a little more about that? There's been a, there was a rebellion, I believe, I don't know, in December of a uh, couple of hundred artists and cultural 
present poets, writers, rebelling against the homogeneity of culture in Cuba. Mm -hmm. And they also claim that there is a uh, control of the internet in Cuba, almost imitating the surveillance state in China, which would be pretty horrendous for Cuba to go down that path. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first of all, on the Cuenta Propista, which is for independent entrepreneurs, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, my, my own feeling is that uh, it, it's, it's okay to have, uh, on a very small scale, uh, individual initiative, but if it goes beyond the, uh, the scale of, you know, of a very few people, uh, that, that I'd prefer to see a cooperative forms uh, encouraged and stimulated and supported. Um, as for the, uh, the larger question of uh, surveillance and uh, political, uh, let's say, conformity, uh, well, that, that's been a perennial problem. And, and I, I guess uh, I, I would say that, that, that just as uh, I don't like violence, I don't like suppression of, uh, of free expression, on the other hand, I, I recognize that in the situation of a country like Cuba, which is, uh, has been constantly under siege ever since it began its revolution in 1959, uh, who are we uh, to, uh, to tell them uh, what's appropriate in, in terms of uh, monitoring and, and watching out for, uh, for subversion? Uh, in the, one thing I haven't mentioned uh, yet in this discussion is uh, the journal Socialism and Democracy, to which I owe a, a, an enormous amount in terms of uh, my formation, in which I had the privilege of, of leading for 20 years. Uh, we, had a, we had a very interesting article, in number 34, by Philip Agee, whose name is probably familiar to most of you, uh, who was talking about the recent crackdown that had taken place then uh, in, in Cuba. And he uh, he pointed out that uh, the people against whom they were cracking down uh, legally were uh, were charged with actually uh, accepting funds from from the United States. So, I, I I guess what I would say in general is that while I can uh, feel some sympathy with people who object to restrictions, I also uh, am hesitant to condemn uh, governments which on the whole are pursuing a positive course, but which have come under tremendous uh, repressive pressure, uh, even uh, increased uh, under the Trump administration, uh, causing tremendous hardship uh, in that country. So I, I'd have to look more closely in terms of what I think of, of each, uh, any given individual in, in that group. And uh, some of you may be more familiar than I am with that. But I, but I think we have to, we have to take a, a nuanced position, not, not have a kind of absolutist idea that just because they, uh, they don't feel uh, free, that they, therefore everything has to be subordinated to their freedom of expression. Um, I see no other, Liz, I, the, you have a hand up, but that's from before, correct? Uh, the icon. So. Victor, I'm, we only have a few minutes left. Is there a closing that you could give to us? And how do we get the new book, et cetera? <laughs> yes, OK. Well, <clears throat> unfortunately, the new book is, uh, the sale price is rather expensive. Uh, but uh, if any of you want it uh, and can't afford it, please get in touch with me. And uh, you can, put, Michael, you want to put my, email in the chat is zendive at aol.com. Please don't hesitate to get in touch with me and uh, I can, uh, we can figure out a, a solution to this quite easily. <laughs> um, but it, uh, otherwise, no, it, it, it's, uh, you, you can order it from any of the uh, regular bookstore outlets. Maybe it'll be eventually re reduced a little bit. But, um, what else in, in, in terms of, of, of closing? I, I, I guess, you know, in, in terms of this audience, I'd say, well, uh, keep on doing what you're already doing. But I mean, it, uh, I would say magnify it. We all have to magnify it the, the, in view of recognizing the incredible level of emergency with which the human species is collectively faced. It, there's, there's 
nothing else we can say about it. It's, and and it, it comes out in so many di different ways. And there are so many different uh, immediate questions that, that get in the way of recognizing this larger issue. But fighting on those immediate questions, like fighting against, against militarism, is integral to the, to the fight uh, uh, to preserve the environment, that the, that the whole uh, imperial structure is, is what's in the way. It's, it's, it's not, uh, not just the uh, impulse of capitalism to expand more and more, but, but all the ways this has uh, refracted itself or, or uh, ch uh, channeled in, into projects of, of, of maintaining supremacy of one kind or another uh, have to be fought. And the, the, the peace movement and the ecological movement and the uh, movement uh, against police brutality, all these, uh, all these integrally belong together. And what can tie them together is a, uh, is a political organization built up on the basis of, a, of an analysis of the entire society of which all these, uh, uh, let's say, uh, abuses uh, that, that we condemn are, are in, uh, integral parts. So seeing that connection and, and bringing it home to everybody uh, on a continuing basis. I mean, of course, we hear this all the time. It's easy enough to say, but finding uh, new ways or, or finding new constituencies uh, and organizing those that already exist, like the political educators we talked about, uh, all that can help. And, and I can only hope that, uh, that something, uh, something big develops, uh, as it has in Chile. You know, it, it, it can happen. There, there are examples to inspire us. And I really appreciate you all participating in this conversation and uh, look forward to hearing from you also uh, uh, if, if you get to read some of the book and want to talk about it. So my email again is zendive, Z-E-N-D-I-V-E at AOL.com. And uh, I look forward to being in touch with you. Thank you very much, Michael. I greatly appreciate your hosting this. Well, Victor, we when you... I just had to find a day and it was such a pleasure to be able to put you today so that all the people who showed up today could show up on another day. They may not have made it. So it's been a great afternoon. I, I'm so happy that you were able to do this and that you were able to get the book together. Uh, I, I will say that that workers control essay that I'm, I'm aware of from before is a, is a great piece and very inspiring and echo what you said in uh, the in the Catalonia region. These are areas where workers did take the world in their hands, much like we, we uh, were, were at the days of the Paris, we're at the 150th anniversary of the commune. Uh, right now is when they started to lose control. But I thought your essay evoked memories of every time workers rose up and, and uh, took control of their world. And I, I was happy that you included that in the book, which I haven't read yet, but I, now that I hear it there, I wanna get the book. So a um, round of applause, Victor, for the book and your career. It's been essential for us on the American left. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you so much to all of you.